So um, today we want to uh, discuss um, how SolidWorks can help um, companies that do machine design, um, leveraging some of the tools that we offer uh, to hopefully allow you to beat the competition, uh, get products uh, out the door a lot faster, which is always the goal. Uh, my name is Brian Real. I'm a uh, certified SolidWorks expert uh, and a field technical services manager. I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> but uh, for CATI, Computer Aided Technology, uh, based here in the Midwest, uh, I'm in the Kansas City office. So um, hopefully uh, everyone can hear me okay. It looks like we were earlier, so let's go ahead and, uh, and get the ball rolling here. So what I'm going to start with uh, is just a quick overview of some of the topics that I want to touch on. Um, first, starting off with just the, the assembly design process. Um, some tools, some oldies but goodies, as well as some new functionality that uh, I think will make uh, putting assemblies together and designing in the assembly um, a lot more uh, enjoyable experience. Um, taking that a step further and focusing on build materials, how the build materials can work inside of SolidWorks, as well as utilizing uh, the build materials to other parts of your company, um, not just in engineering, but maybe other uh, aspects of your company as well. Um, also showing you how to how to reuse your design. Uh, I know myself personally, I came from a machine design background, and uh, no matter what we would design, the, the next customer would want something, you know, just a lot like it, but maybe a little different. So having the ability to, to capture what you've already designed uh, and reuse it, uh, but tweak it a little bit, uh, is, is something that's very powerful uh, in SolidWorks as well. Um, we'll also touch on some of the tools that you can use to help Validate your design. Um, is it going to function the way that I want it to? Is it, um, you know, going to withstand forces and, and, and pressures or, or whatever uh, real life conditions it might see? Uh, showing you different ways to use that, um, and also to, to kind of round everything out. Once you have your design either done or mostly done, it's always nice to be able to communicate that to other persons, um, other groups within the company, uh, other shareholders. Uh, with the actual design itself. So we'll, we'll highlight some of the various tools that SolidWorks has uh, to allow you to get through that as well. So let's start off with, um, as I said, some, some kind of oldies but goodies, but um, things that I think make you more productive in a SolidWorks environment. Um, the first one that, that I, I strongly urge users to follow is just the simple pop-up bar. And you get this pop-up bar in various aspects of, of the software, but specifically if I'm going to apply uh, just the standard mate type, whether it's a coincident or concentric, uh, or even some of the advanced ones, which I'll highlight here in a little bit, um, having that ability to hold control, pre-select the two faces, again, not moving your mouse after you hit that second item, let go of the control key, and this pop-up bar will instantly provide you with a lot of nuggets of goodness, as I like to refer to as uh, these, these shortcuts to go right to a coincident mate, for example, and those two faces would, would become coincident. Um, I don't have to start the mate command first. If I know I'm going to apply those types of mates, definitely the fastest way to get there. Another kind of a newer technique, um, if you, again, don't want to, uh, to start the mate command first, uh, a new option allows you to do what's called a component preview. And, and really when you're putting things together and you're getting into more complex assemblies, um, you do have the the chance where other parts are going to be hiding the part you're trying to get to. Now you can obviously make those parts hidden or transparent, and there's you know various techniques to go down that road. But this newer option of component preview, um, as the, the pictures show here, the left picture, I'm selecting on a component, again, looking for that pop-up bar, um, picking the component preview icon, which is then going to split your screen into two models, like you see on the right-hand side. So the left-hand side of that split is showing the entire assembly the way you have it positioned, but it's hiding or, or turning that part transparent, um, which might make it easier to pick something else as well. But over on the right-hand side of that split, you have that part by itself. So I can spin and rotate and get that hidden edge, that hidden face, uh, without having to rotate the entire assembly. So it, 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 again, another nice way to use the software, uh, but, but something that you know, might speed up your design as you go through that. Another, um, not, not necessarily a newer technique, but something that's been around for a number of years as well, if you do like to start the mate command before you pick anything, um, a newer availability or newer option has happened to where 
when I pick that first item, whether it's a face or edge, whatever, from that first component, that component will automatically become transparent. You kind of saw that on my last screenshot as well. Um, the benefit of that is if that first item is transparent, I can pick right through it and grab something else. I don't have to always rely on my 3D mouse to spin and rotate and, and to get to various things. Not everybody has that device, but here's a nice way to uh, to pick through items without having to first make them transparent or hidden, um, which if you hide them, I guess it makes it tough to animate anyway, but uh, definitely the transparent part is, is something you want to be aware of. Um, the newest option for, for 2018 um, takes this a step further. Um, when you start the mate command itself, you now have the ability to temporarily hide any face that's in the way. Uh, in the past, we would click on a face or right click and choose select other, which would bring up a whole list of faces that you could kind of you know, go through which one you want or which one you don't want. But now, just simply hovering your mouse over an item and pressing the Alt key on the keyboard will temporarily hide those faces. Now, I've hidden three or four. We probably didn't need to hide all those, but I just wanted to have a nice picture where you could see I'm trying to grab that underneath face of that bracket. And by using the hide command within the mate command, just again pressing the Alt key, is a quick way to hide and get rid of stuff that you just don't need to see. Another, I guess, kind of a newer option, um, this has been out for just a couple of years now. Let's see if I can get this to, uh, to animate here. But what it, what it allows you to do is called a mate controller. And um, what it allows us to do is to use the mates that we've applied within our assembly, uh, limit mates uh, for travel, limit distance, limit angles. And you can basically have your machine follow you know, a certain range of motion. And um, one motion won't happen until the next one finishes, et cetera. But it allows you to get a really good testing of you know, is this doing what I think it should be doing? Am I, am I designing it the right way so that it's going to function the right way? Um, and as you can tell, once you get done with that animation, you do have the option to save it out as a, uh, an AVI file, which then I can play or show to somebody else. But it's a nice way to visually, you know, make sure that this machine is moving uh, in the directions that I, that I intended it to do. Another newer command, um, this has been kind of reworked a little bit for 2018. They've added some more options. But uh, it, it actually was introduced, I believe, last year for 2017. Um, it's called magnetic mates. So this is really a new type of mate. Um, you won't find it in the mate command. It, it's actually a kind of a different uh, structure. But the goal is, for anyone that does facility layouts, plant layouts, you're positioning your equipment into you know, a large open space, and you might have some feeder equipment like these conveyors or things like that. Um, in the past, when you tried to assemble those things, you, you typically had to either, you know, zoom in and pick this real thin little face and say that, that face needs to be coincident or, or touching this other thin little face. You just had to do a lot of zooming and panning to, to select the entities that you want. And then you might have been able to add some um, mate references or things like that to speed it along. But the whole purpose of a magnetic mate is it's a feature that gets added to either a subassembly or a part. And the premise is that if I take that subassembly and drag it into a new assembly, when it sees a connection point, so you've determined ahead of time that that curved conveyor uh, is going to be you know, attached to some other conveyor. So it, it looks for these attachment points. And when it finds those, you'll see this little purple, kind of like a rubber band string <laughs> like you see on the screen here. And when you see that icon, that means, hey, you're close enough. If you let go of the mouse, that curve conveyor will snap right up against the, uh, the, the horizontal or the straight conveyor that you see there. So you don't have to do a lot of zooming and panning. It's going to automatically snap together based on your uh, predefined values. Now, the cool thing about this is if you're testing the layout, making sure it's going to work right, again, just simply click and drag that, that uh, curve conveyor back away and uh, those parts will separate. So it's not locking it. You don't have to go suppress mates to be able to move and, and, and put it in a different fashion. Um, it allows you to very easily uh, test these what-if scenarios by just simply dragging and dropping and, and connecting things together. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at magnetic mates, uh, again, it's only been out for a couple of releases now, but uh, might be something uh, worthwhile. Another newer mate type, I'm um, seeing more companies use the this in their designs is, is creating slots, right? The, the whole purpose of a slotted hole 
it gives us a little more flexibility um, for things that don't have to be quite so precise. I have more more clearance, <laughs> a little more slop, if you will, in, in putting things together in the real world. But the, the nice thing about this is as I select a slot surface, and it doesn't matter which surface you pick, if it's the straight surface or the curved surface, it's going to recognize that entire slot. And when it sees that, that's your first item. You pick the, the connecting item. In this case, it's that little shank surface. When I select those, it's going to snap the two together. And, and the nice thing about this is, is when, you, when it snaps those two together with a mate, it's actually movable. It's flexible. So um, depending on the constraint types, which I'll show you what those are here in just a second, but you've got multiple choices of how that needs to be attached. Uh, if it's a free or to the center, um, you can even do that like a percentage or distance away, uh, which allows you to, to, to really lock down that motion. One of the best, I think, all-time newest mates that have been added uh, is this uh, profile center mate. And the beautiful thing about this is you can get it from that shortcut bar. So if you, again, without running any command, if you just select two closed profile faces, so it could be a square face, a round face, or I mean a circular face, a triangular face, doesn't matter. This needs to be something that is closed. When you select those two faces, it's going to naturally put those two together. Um, the, the nice thing about this works great for fasteners, um, bolts, washers, things of that nature. By selecting those two faces to connect to, um, it will automatically position it as well as keep it from rotating. So you can actually lock the rotation all at one mate. Uh, you don't have to do a bunch of extra mates to keep things from rotating around um, if you're that type of person that, that doesn't like to see any minus signs in their uh, their hardware out folder. Um, it's, it's a quick way to do that. Um, you've got a couple of options here, the, the rotate buttons. So as the two get placed, you can choose to rotate it by 90 degrees, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. So it's just a, a really fun command. When they first added this, it was part of the advanced mates. So you had to go into the mate command, expand the folder, and get to it. And it didn't take long. I think the very next year they added it as a shortcut. Um, so yeah, hold control, pick the two faces, and you'll see the, uh, the profile center mate as a choice. Uh, so give it a try if you haven't uh, played with that yet. And then another oldie but goodie, the width mate. Um, I unfortunately left a lot of my machine design world to, to come into this world. And we didn't have the width mate back when I was designing equipment. So um, I don't know how many times I had to pick you know, planes and center the planes or, or pick the overall uh, distance between the two parts and, and maybe do a distance mate or something like that. It was just a lot of, of extra work if I wanted two things to be centered. Um, and now with the width mate, this too is another one of those shortcuts. If you, uh, without running any command, just hold control and pick all four faces, the two faces of part one and two faces of part two, it will automatically allow you to go right to the width mate. Um, the new options here in the last couple of years is, is different ways to solve that width mate. So it's very similar to the slot command. Uh, you've got these three or four choices. The width mate allows you to do that as well. So um, again, it's another kind of an oldie, but uh, they, they definitely have enhanced, enhanced it a little bit the last couple of years, uh, giving you some additional choices. Um, last but not least from the uh, the assembly design. Um, actually, we're not quite done yet, but, but I do want to talk about the patterns. Um, using patterns in assembly are a great way to increase performance and uh, just decrease rebuild time. The benefit of using patterns is we don't have to solve mates for every instance of that component. That pattern is really controlling that. So um, you notice we have a lot of pattern commands. You've got the linear, the circular, uh, even sketch-driven, you know, things you might use in a part design world. Um, curve driven, obviously the mirror component is a very handy tool that's been out for a number of years as well. Um, but, but one that um, I don't know, think gets a whole lot of, of play, uh, not a whole lot of people are using it, is this pattern driven component pattern option. And, and basically what that boils down to is if you have, let's say, a linear pattern in a part, and when you take that part to the assembly, you want to uh, propagate it with bolts and washers and, and, and fasteners of sorts. If you were to create one of those bolt stacks, put one of those into that pattern, that initial instance of the pattern, then choose pattern driven component pattern, it will take all of those fasteners and automatically duplicate them or copy it to every other instance of that hole. So the benefit of that is if this part should ever change its pattern, 
if we increase the hold, decrease the hold, change the spacing, your assembly is going to update automatically with those fasteners. So any part that's mated to another uh, pattern uh, will have that update, that update option. So it's a nice way to, again, speed up the assembly um, with, with not having to add a, a bunch of top-level mates, uh, which, as we all know, can, can slow things down a little bit. The, the newest option for the pattern command is the, the chain pattern. And uh, this is just a great visual. I love this one. Uh, it really shows it well. But basically what we're doing is you're creating a pattern of those uh, cat track components. And the benefit of creating a pattern, not only do you get to see it animate or move as if it was real life, but you get an accurate bill of material. You get an accurate part count. So I know how many of these pieces are we going to be assembling um, or how many to buy if, if you buy them loose. Um, but it's a nice way to work with, with these types of components, uh, chain links. If you want to have a chain follow a pattern, um, basically anything following a kind of a sketch path really is what it's looking at. They're easy to set up, um, and they do solve pretty quickly. Uh, very visual, nice nice way to, uh, to test your design and, and make sure that it, again, is performing the way you intended or you're trying to show to somebody what it's going to look like. So uh, great tools that, that I would use in the uh, machine design world. Um, and then the, the other part of the assembly features, we talked a bit about the patterns, but another command uh, that has been added or they keep adding to this option is, is more ways to do features from a part level but at the assembly level. Sometimes when you put things together in manufacturing, once they're assembled, then you create some type of feature and you have the ability to add all of these features now. But I think the one that, that maybe doesn't get as much airplay as it should is the weld bead feature. And what this allows you to do is to create the appearance of a weld, and I say appearance because you're not actually modeling. In the past, we modeled a separate body or a separate part for every weld, uh, and it was just kind of a clutter to uh, to keep track of in the bill of material. You had all these weird parts and stuff like that. Well, now it's not even a part. It's just a, rep a representation, almost a surface body that doesn't really calculate or show anywhere. But what it will do is not only add the annotation, like you can see on the bottom right, but it also places um, the length of weld into um, kind of a weld property, a folder that gets created at the assembly level. And if you edit these weld properties, you can actually go in and assign a certain cost. Uh, for example, if you're trying to get a cost estimate of how long or how much it's going to cost to weld a frame, uh, we charge so much per lineal foot, and we can weld it takes so long to do a certain you know, length of weld. If you know those values, you can propagate those into that, that value or into that, uh, that weld property. And then when you go to make a drawing of your weldment, you can actually insert a weld uh, chart. And that weld chart will actually show the types of welds, the size, the, uh, the, the cost if you want to have that. I guess you could probably even assign some other parameters. But it's just using these, these parameters to really convey uh, downstream what's, what's happening. Uh, so so WeldBeat is a, is a really nice command. It can be used at the assembly level. You can also use this at a part level if you're making a multi-body weldment, a part weldment. You can use the same WeldBeat command for that as well. So a uh, very, very handy uh, feature. All right, let's focus a little bit on uh, bill materials. And, and as I said, there's a, a number of ways to work with bill materials. Um, when you first start a bill material in SOLIDWORKS, you actually got two options. You can create a, an Excel-based bill material or just a regular bill material. Uh, the Excel-based is more for, for old, um, not old as in old, but uh, uh, legacy customers, I guess, that have had SOLIDWORKS for a number of years. Because in the early days, that was really the only way we could create a bill material. You had to have Excel loaded on your, on your same computer. Um, and then about 2004, SOLIDWORKS created their own bill material. Uh, which is what I'm showing right here, much more functional. Um, you get little things like the little preview window like I'm showing there. So if I hover over the part called swivel, it shows me a nice screenshot of what it's going to look like. Um, just, just little things like that that, that make it more user friendly. Uh, but the same uh, ability to modify are there, uh, left justify, right justify, changing your font size, uh, et cetera. It, it's all part of that, that nor um, natural build material process. Um, what bill of materials are doing is they're looking at your, your custom properties. And I would ask that uh, every one of you guys is, is using custom properties inside of your part files and assembly files because that's where the bill of material can pull that information. 
Uh, in this case, we have uh, I've shown the, uh, the the subassembly called base and some of the custom properties that I've added for that particular assembly file, the part number, a weight, which is kind of a total weight for that subassembly. Uh, and all that is is, is a custom property. So um, from a bill of material standpoint, if I want to add a column, um, once I've inserted that bomb, just right click at the top of the column header, uh, this, this row right here, if I just right click on any one of those cells, I can insert a column to the right or to the left. And in this case, I've added a custom property called weight. So because I've used these values in the parts and in the subassembly, those weight values are going to automatically propagate. So the whole purpose here is you're typing it in one time. You're doing it once at the part level or once at the assembly level, and that's it. You can use it for free in all these other places, on a drawing, for example, or uh, in any one of these tables. So that's the whole purpose of, of using those custom properties uh, to attach that data. Another way to, to use this bill of material, uh, a lot of companies would like to take that data and be able to share it, right? Why, why give your drawing to somebody else in accounting and they have to you know, manually retype all this into an Excel sheet or, or retype it into their MRP or ERP software? Um, you have the option within SOLIDWORKS to simply right mouse click on that bill of material and you can export it or save it. And you can save it as a bunch of different Excel files uh, even the generic text or CSV, if uh, that's what your software can read in from the other side. But again, the whole purpose is type it in once and then share it throughout the organization. And that's a very common theme that, uh, that I think SolidWorks is trying to say. Another tool that allows you to use this bill of material uh, is a product called PDM, or Product Data Management. Now, this is a separate piece of software uh, that actually runs with SolidWorks within as well as outside um, but the purpose of this is I'm, I'm now sharing my engineering bill of material with the whole company. Whoever has access to see it can see it. Um, they can't change anything necessarily, but at least they can see my, my uh, items or components. But they see so much more. Uh, instead of the old days of going and finding a drawing and looking for the bill of material, they can just click on this tab in Windows Explorer and they see all the information that I wanted to give them. The file name, uh, part numbers for it the quantities, but they get other stuff. Where's the file at in its, in its evolution? Is it approved? Is it still being worked on? Uh, what revision is that file at? I mean, these are things that you typically don't always get to see on a drawing itself. So you have a nice way to see that data uh, throughout the company. And it's not just limited to engineering. Again, anyone in the organization would have access to see that. So that's using a, a third party or an extra piece of software called PDM. Uh, which is also part of SolidWorks Professional or Premium, uh, or you can you can buy the uh, the enhanced version PDM Professional, uh, which can be attached to any license of SolidWorks. Another, uh, just kind of sticking with the PDM here, one other way uh, as far as reusing designs. Sometimes it was nice to be able to uh, select on a file uh, a certain bracket or a piece of uh, piece of hardware or whatever that I might use on multiple designs. Um, I can select that component and say, PDM, tell me where all this is used. And again, it's just another tab. You notice the little tabs I have across here. But there's a where use tab. So if I'm looking for this particular fastener and I want to know how many times I'm going to have to go modify or change, what other files is going to, you know, do I, do I have to go update if I change this to a different size or get a different supplier or whatever? Um, sometimes you don't have to do those, but let's say we do need to make those design changes. This tells me right up front which files I'm going to have to go modify or open so that I can update and, and change that data. Um, no more having to just guess <laughs> on which machines we use that particular design. Um, I can instantly find that by using the where used. Another way to reuse data, and this is something that I used myself. Um, we, we had a lot of equipment that used hydraulic cylinders or pneumatic cylinders. And uh, I oftentimes wanted to use that data um, but visually see it so I could actually see the, the machine um, do its movement or motion, whatever it was that I was testing. And what I would do is I would create multiple configurations of, in this case, a purchased component, something I just downloaded uh, from 3D content. And what this allows me to do is to, to insert this multiple times in my assembly, but each instance could have its own configuration. So, uh, I would typically create what I call a, a closed, so it's completely retracted. Uh, maybe I have another version where it's completely extended, um, so it's a, just a quick click or select, and I go right to that configuration. 
uh, any components mated to it are going to move and, and do what they're going to do based on that. And then I might have a third configuration, which I call the free, meaning that that command or that, that rod can actually stroke in and out whatever distance or limit that I told it to move. So I can actually do kind of a full range of motion, seeing, you know, closed, extended, and then something in between. Um, and, and that was a way that I used configurations to reuse these on multiple designs uh, because I could show a different configuration on each one. It's not going to affect the original. And talking about reusing design again, uh, a nice little function here called Pack and Go. This has been a command that's been around for a number of years. Um, they do uh, add enhancements to it. Uh, a couple of newer options, the uh, ability to um, not only include drawings, but maybe if I want to include simulation results. And basically what it's doing is it's taking my design. Uh, I just did a, a small subassembly to, to get a screenshot here. But it's taking that assembly and all the parts used in that assembly, and it's allowing me to either save them to another folder. So maybe I want to do a, a similar but different. So I can create a new copy of all those files. I can give them a different name if I want to. I could manually rename one or two if I want to keep the original the same. Um, maybe you know, 89 of my 80 percent of my parts are going to be the same, but 20 percent are going to be different. Well, this is a quick way to copy all that, and uh, it, it's separate from the original. So I can go in and, and rename or, or give new file names, uh, and I can uh, easily reuse that data for other purposes. All right, let's uh, focus in on design validation next. I've got a few slides that uh, kind of talk about the, uh, the different tools that we can use inside of uh, SOLIDWORKS, not only simulation uh, and costing, but also MBD or inspection. And then we'll highlight the newest product, which is SOLIDWORKS CAM. So for simulation, what we're basically doing is we're looking at a part or an assembly, and we're going to test to see uh, if it's going to function. Is it going to do what we want it to do? So in this case, let's say we're going to make a, a sheet metal uh, bracket, or in this case, maybe it's a, a holder for various components. And what I want to do is first figure out what's the best material for that part. So maybe I'm going to test this design with four different material types. And using simulation, it's very easy to do that. I can come up with a, a certain factor of safety, whatever it is that I'm looking for, to allow this to be safe enough. And based on that, it looks like carbon steel is going to be my my strongest material for the way that it's currently designed. Now that I have a, a good idea for the safety and the weight aspect of it, um, what about the cost? How much is it going to cost to manufacture that? Well, if you have SOLIDWORKS Professional or SOLIDWORKS Premium, you get a costing application built into SOLIDWORKS. So with this, I'm now able to estimate based off of my tooling, the, the ways I have to produce this in-house, uh, or if I'm going to send it out to somebody, um, but I can get a costing estimate uh, of what it's going to cost to to manufacture or to build that part. So, you know, maybe this comes into play a little bit in your machine design. Can I do it a little cheaper? Can I do something different? Um, reduce the weight a little bit, but yet still, you know, keep my costs down. And it's just a, a great tool to do those what-if scenarios. You're not always relying on um, tribal knowledge of what the best material is. Um, test it out. It, it takes just a few minutes. You can see which one here might be the better for your solution. So that's using simulation and costing in tandem. What about using just simulation by itself? Uh, and, and some of these are older examples, but they still show pretty well. So uh, I've borrowed them for, uh, for this, this uh, presentation. But you know, if we're trying to lift or, or do some, some uh, actuating here, uh, where can we remove the material? How, how light can we make it? Will it still you know, perform and do what we need it to do? So these are all questions that simulation can help you with. Um, not only simulation from a, a stress testing standpoint, but also uh, using motion. And motion allows you to, to test or see those forces, how they change at different positions of your, uh, of your machine, um, using time-based. So from this zero seconds to five seconds, it's going to actuate to this location. And, uh, and you can, again, test and, and, and get those different forces at each one of those different positions, uh, which is great data to feed back into into simulation. Um, again, just simple things like, is this going to be designed well enough? Uh, what's the best frame? This is an oldie as well, but this is kind of a fun one. Um, using the same material, the same number of cut, the same number of welds, which one's going to perform better? So if I mount the, uh, the, the support legs at 30 degrees, 45, or 60, which one's going to work the best? And uh, between yourselves, you guys can guess at a number if you like, but uh, I'll show you the answer here in just a second. So as far as looking at stress testing, they all seem to be 
yeah, pretty much the same or very close to being similar. But if we dive into each one, we can see that the 30 degree has just about a millimeter of deflection. Again, not much, but uh, enough to, to maybe think about. Uh, factor safety, a little over two. If we rotate that a little bit more to 45 degrees, we're going to get a little less deflection and a little higher factor safety, so we're up over 2.5. But if we use the 60, that's actually our best choice. Again, no real material change or costing differences, but just by positioning them slightly differently, uh, we've increased almost uh, an extra factor of safety from the first one, um, as well as almost half the deflection uh, just by switching to that different angle. So again, these are things that simulation allows you to answer um, very quickly and, and, and very easily. Um, some other tools to help with design validation, MBD uh, or inspection. MBD is this image over here to the right where basically you're adding your model-based definition. That's what MBD stands for. It's your PMI, your product manufacturing information, added to the 3D part or to the 3D assembly. So at the part or assembly level, you're adding all of your dimensions, your tolerances, uh, GD and T standards if you're following those, and it allows you to create views of that 3D model. You can publish it to a PDF like I've shown here. Uh, this PDF, if I open it, I can spin and rotate those views um, and really get a good understanding of how to manufacture uh, this particular part. So it's a different approach from the 2D drawing, the traditional approach, uh, but you can still, you're still conveying all that data uh, just at a, um, a much more visual appearance. Uh, the other option is using inspection. If anyone gets into first article inspection, uh, inspection is a great tool, uh, again, built inside of SOLIDWORKS or standalone. You've got two options there. But I can take my existing SOLIDWORKS model, my existing SOLIDWORKS 2D drawing, and I can quickly balloon and call out everything that needs to be inspected. Um, again, with a single click, I can export that entire chart into an Excel file. And this is something to, uh, quality control can use to go measure and enter in the values that they get. Um, and it's just a, you know, a very digital way to do that versus traditional methods. And then finally, the newest option uh, for SOLIDWORKS is SOLIDWORKS CAM. Uh, this was introduced for 2018. Anyone with any license, whether it's a standard license, uh, a professional, or a premium, you're going to get access to SOLIDWORKS CAM, uh, a two and a half axis milling program. So this allows us to do tool uh, path generation, feature recognition, all built into SOLIDWORKS. Uh, it's using uh, SOLIDWORKS' partner CAMWORKS to generate that. Uh, long history between these two companies, uh, but this is a newer option that you'll see for 2018. And then finally, some communication tools. There's, there's a couple that I wanted to highlight. The first one is called SOLIDWORKS Composer. And, and this is a tool that allows your other departments to take what you've designed uh, maybe you have a marketing team or a, a tech publication group where they're creating documentation to either use on the shop floor. Um, maybe it's an animation video that you want your, your assemblers to follow. Or it could be uh, images like I have shown here. Uh, the left-hand image is, is basically just inserted into PDF documents. Uh, the right-hand image could be a web, a web based page uh, where you can actually highlight and get some interaction as you click on each one of these components. It'll highlight what you've selected. So it's just another way from just the, the, the traditional 2D drawing snapshot of conveying data. Um, it is 3D. I'm reusing that data. I'm not having to recreate anything necessarily. Um, you spent the time designing it. Let's let other company or other parts of your company utilize that data uh, to make their job a little bit easier as well. And then finally, another communication tool is SolidWorks Visualize. Um, using inside of SOLIDWORKS itself, you have access to PhotoView 360, which is the rendering that you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, not bad. It's still pretty good, good quality. It's kind of what we call a draft quality uh, of a rendering software. But then new to, I think, 2016, 2015, when it was first introduced, uh, is SOLIDWORKS Visualize Professional, which allows you to create much, much, much higher-end uh, visual renderings for your, your products. I didn't have a machine, so I couldn't really do a machine design render, but um, this was just one I found that uh, kind of highlights the differences between the two. Uh, so it's another way to communicate your design uh, without you know, taking snapshots and pictures once it's being built. Uh, you can actually do this beforehand. So just to kind of summarize what I have shown here today, um, we, we did talk a little bit about some of the, the tools to make your assembly process easier. Um, you know, some different design techniques that, that might speed your day along a little bit. Using that bill of material 
um, not only internal to SOLIDWORKS, how to set it up correctly or utilize those custom properties, but also being able to share it uh, with, that other, with, with other parts of your organization. Uh, reusing that machine design with, with either the, uh, the pack and go, the copy tools, or the configurations. Um, again, keeping in mind that most everything I've shown is a single interface, you're, you're doing almost all this from within inside SOLIDWORKS. You don't have to learn a separate piece of, of software, and that's, that's going to make you productive as well, uh, just keeping everything into one area. So for the validation, the costing, the MBD, the inspection, even CAM, all runs inside of SOLIDWORKS. Uh, and then finally, communicating that with using either composure documents that, that can be generated uh, or, or visualized. Just to, uh, to highlight uh, a couple of upcoming webinars, if, if you guys are interested in some of the other topics that we have, um, it looks like next week we've, we've got one for 3D printing uh, and a little more additive manufacturing uh, options there. We've got some other webcasts that you can see. Um, if you want to sign up for any of those, just click on, or you have to type in, I should say, this link uh, at the bottom of the screen, and, and they'll take you to our, our webinar play, uh, page at the CATI website. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to join those if, if those are of interest. And then finally, I'll just open up the, uh, the chat request here. If you guys have any, any questions on anything I've shown, uh, if you want to send me an email for something more specific, I'd be happy to answer that for you. Um, but you can uh, can submit a chat if you'd like. We'll leave that open for just a couple of minutes. Um, thank you guys very much for attending. I hope you were able to learn something from this. And uh, we'll leave the chat open if we get any questions.